Oh, what is up, everybody? Welcome back. This is the Jason Stapleton Program, broadcasting live from the Random Walk Studios, deep in the heart of America. Well, I guess technically we are here, you and I, doing it live, but we're not actually... This is... We're recording this. Yes. Because... Mainly because my life has become such a gigantic fireball of confusion that the, 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 coming in here and doing this stuff, get setting up the cameras and everything is just becoming too much of a struggle. So as you guys know, I've been gone for quite a while. I have been in the mountains of Colorado, high atop the mountains, mind you, and we were above 10,000 feet, I believe, and uh, I was there for like 12 to 14 hours a day, no cell reception. I should be like super excited about having the opportunity to go out and do this, but all I could think of was how much stuff I had to get done, and we were working 12, 14 hours a day, if you can call it that. I mean, guys who guys who dig ditches, guys who lay fiber optic cable, those guys work for a living. I I really but most of them but, I well, drive by, yeah i see like four guys standing around while one that's city dick, workers so. yeah even dude but even standing outside in the breaking hot sun yeah. holding a sign is is worse than what i was doing i was in it was 70 degrees and beautiful up in the mountains and all i had to do was say words are you ready was, to move yet what's that are you ready oh, to move? i'm so ready man oh. the only thing that kills me the only thing that kills me is that their internet mm. it's like it's so spotty as soon as you get up into the mountains it's you know it's a it's a guessing game. You mean they and, don't run fiber optic to ten thousand feet? Well, oh, they will. The right I guarantee price. you, they will. Somebody <laughs> somewhere will lay it. And like the, the where we were at it was at the very top of a of a mountain, and the house that we weren't actually at the house, but they had a house there, mm-hmm. and and they gave us access to the house if we needed to like hang out or anything. And uh, and I never I was up there one time, but it was a beautiful home, apparently uh, built by some uh, billionaire. Texas oil tycoon, and he actually had what was originally a helipad that was right down on that because he ain't driving up the mountain. It took like an hour and a half to get up the hill. Yeah, and he wasn't doing that. He was going to fly his helipad he- right onto the helipad. A beautiful home, which now somebody else owns it. Somebody had bought it, and he was the guy who was letting us use it. And a uh, really, really nice guy, too. And so we were down the hill from there at this beautiful like valley where we were doing all of our shooting. But I mean. I mean, what's my job? My job is to stand there. We were we were working with and doing experiments and stuff there. I was there with Travis Taylor. Uh, you guys may know him from Rocket City Rednecks. He's one of the smartest dudes I've ever met in my life, and sounds like he should be turning wrenches on on an on a Volvo, right? He just he talks. He's from Alabama, and so he talks like this all the time. And everything everything is animated with him. I mean, super animated. And he's an awesome guy. He really is. But you would not think that the guy had two PhDs, four master's degrees, had written 25 sci-fi novels, and is working on some of the most secret government projects that you could imagine. But that's who he is. And so I'm down there with him, and he's running experiments, and he's like, here, hold this, and, and okay, here's what we're going to do. And we're it's super dangerous, I'm told, what we're doing in these experiments, but I, I'm, I'm in I'm in Travis's trusted hands, and so I, he, he managed to not get me killed while we were up there. Um, but I mean, my, my, I live the greatest life. I have to. Uh, the only downside is that I have to be away from my family for like four or five days at a time, which really stinks while I'm doing this show, uh, the TV show. But think about what I get to do. I mean, I show up. I get to talk about the news, which we're going to talk about today. We'll talk about the uh, we'll talk about the ACLU, and we'll talk transgenders. We'll talk a little bit about the Houston evacuation, the uh, Storm Harvey that hit, and some of the devastation that's going on there. If we have time, we'll get to Joe Arparo, Arpaio, and and his pardon by Donald Trump, and we're going to talk about all this stuff. But I. I get to come in, sit down with you, talk about stuff that interests me. I get to uh, my job is really, if you think about how I make my money. My job is really to help people make their dreams become a reality, right? So if you financially want to be better off and you're going to start a business or if you're looking to invest or trade your money that you have, I teach people how to do that so that they can live a lifestyle that they wouldn't otherwise be able to live. Uh, I get to go and have somebody else pay for me to stand in front of a camera and tell people what I think. I mean, dude... And I get paid well for this. It's not like it's not like I get paid chump change to do this stuff. Like I get paid really well to do this. It's um, I mean, I'm flat out amazed at how my life has turned out. Because if you had talked to me ten years ago, would have never thought that this was where I would end up. 
I figured I'd be dead on the side of the road somewhere in some godforsaken land and, or, or bleeding out of multiple holes and with, with part of my body parts missing, right? That's the way most, a lot of guys turn out that, that go downrange to do the type of work that I was doing. And if they'd have said when I was doing that, hey, do you know that you're going to be working on a television show with Travis Taylor and you know, you're going to be turning wrenches with him and, and making stuff glow, I'd have been like, no. Yeah, I laughed at him. And so it's, I guess, what I'm, try, what I'm trying to get at, I guess, is that it is, don't ever consider yourself to, don't consider yourself to be fixed at, in a point in life. And hey, I've already come this far down this track and I've been doing this thing for 10 years or 15 years. And so I'm just stuck doing this now because it's all I know how to do. Fix it. Learn to do something else. Or take what you're already doing and teach other people how to do it. I, I have this conversation with people all the time because they, they're like, hey, I want to I – well, I was talking with a guy this weekend. I'll tell you another story. I was talking to a guy this weekend who is a, a sommelier. Now, that is a France, fancy French word that we don't use around here, Darren, mm-hmm. but that's a guy who knows a lot about wine. And he was talking about, uh, he was asking me some questions about business, and he said, I'm thinking about going to this course, and I'm going to become a master sommelier. Uh, he said, and I said, and he's like, I'm wondering what I should do. And I said, well, do you like wine? He's like, I love wine. Like wine's my favorite thing in the whole wide world. I said, well, then do that. He said, well, it's the money's kind of holding me back. He's like, I just made a little bit of money and I could use that money to do this, but it's a lot of money. And I'm like, well, you love wine, right? Well, I love wine. Okay, then do that. He's like, I should do that. It's like, sometimes that's all people need is they just yeah. need the reinforcement of someone saying, no, dude, you should do that. Like, if that's what you really love, you should spend your money on stuff that's going to help you become more proficient at whatever it is you love doing. And I said, so you really like talking about wine. You like telling people, dude, I love that. I, I could talk about wine all day and all night. And this is what he does for his job. So normally, even if you love something, eventually you're like, dude, I don't want to talk about that anymore. Mm-hmm. Like when we talk about politics here, I'm pretty much done talking about politics for the day when we finish this show. Uh, but he's like, he's like, no, I love it that much. And I said, well, you should read a book called Crush It by Gary Vanderchuk. Gary V, many of you may know Gary because now he's a uh, kind of a business coach. But back when he wrote Crush It, he was a guy who was building an online business, an online wine business, back when the internet was really, online marketing was kind of a new thing. And he started out doing a show telling people about wine. And he happened to, his dad owned the wine store where they did it all out of, right? And so he would just talk about wine and he would teach people about it because the big thing about wine drinkers is if you're if you're going to a nice restaurant and you don't know anything about wine, which most people don't, even the people who think they know about wine really don't understand wine, um, they don't want to look stupid in front of everybody else, especially if they've come into money recently and now they're really in a class of people that they don't belong in because they don't know how to operate in that space. And I said, you should really read that book because I said, whatever you're making as a sommelier, you can probably make three times that teaching people about wine and just talking about what it is you love to do. He's like, really? I said, yeah, man, let me give you some examples. Let me tell you a little bit about what Gary did in order to make his work, his business work. He's like, man, I could totally do that. I said, you should get what then you, I said, once you start doing videos and you start talking a little bit about wine, I said, the wine companies will come to you. So let's say you start a podcast, you get a bunch yeah. of listeners. Now all of a sudden you got sponsorships. That's and right. Making money. And, yeah. but, and not only that, but I said, they'll send you wine. They'll pay you to talk about their particular wine and you can get a cut of all the stuff that comes in. I said, then you get big enough. You're not talking about cuts of stuff that comes in. They'll just pay you straight up to talk about their wine and i said you don't have to if it's if it's if it's dirt if it's not good you don't have to take them because you're going to have plenty of other people who want to uh who want to share their wine on your show and he's like man i didn't even think about that and that was just a conversation that we had over about 20 minutes and i don't know what he's going to do with it implementation becomes the hard part right so i i'm really good at sharing this stuff with him but now he's got to take the a he's got to spend the next year the next two years really developing and building that and so what i kind of do is that's what i i help people with right so i say okay now we've got this idea how do we implement it how do we go find people how do you want to structure your video content all of those kinds of things is really what i do but man dude watching the fire in this guy's eyes when he talked about something he was passionate about and then giving him the roadmap on how he can make 
all the money he could ever want to make doing what it is he loves to do and talking about the subject that's interesting to him, that's powerful. If that's not you, if you're not doing that, you're wrong. Okay, I'm just going to tell you, you're wrong. You're not in the right place. If you don't wake up every morning, work doesn't all, isn't always fun. Sometimes going to work and doing stuff sucks. I can tell you we were on the mountain at 1 o'clock in the morning, and we'd done like 50 takes of something, and it was not enjoyable to be there. We were freezing. It was like 40 degrees outside. Business is not always fun, but every day I get up, and I'm excited about the work I get to do. And if you are not, then you're wrong. You, you've made a wrong turn somewhere. You are in a wrong place in your life. You are not living the life that you were supposed to be living. And I'm just going to challenge you today because I realized as I was, when I was up on top of that mountain, just how good I got it. And I want to share that with you and let you understand that it was not that many years ago. That was not where I was. I was missing my daughter grow up. I mean, I, my, my wife was sending me back then you would send it, you couldn't send it through the internet because the internet was so bad. So she would send me DVDs of, of my first daughter, Haley. And I remember one time she, Haley was, was crawling for the first time. I miss, I'm missing everything. I mean, I'm missing, I'm missing her walk for the first time. I missed her crawl for the first time. And she's sending me pictures. I'm watching my daughter grow up on, in pictures and in DVDs that she's sending me. And I'm like, this is not, this is not the life I want. And she sent me a DVD one time of she's holding out the pacifier and Haley is trying to crawl to the pacifier and she's crying. She's just like, oh. she's just screaming. She wants the pacifier and she's reaching for it. My wife's holding it out there just far enough where she can't get it. And so then she drags herself a little way and she reaches for it. My wife pulls it back just a little bit more and you just see her, her little head collapses and she's just crying into the carpet and I'm, I'm watching it and I'm, cr- I'm crying while I'm watching it and I'm yelling at the computer monitor, just give it to her, just give it to her, Laura, just give it to her. And I'm like, the tears are coming down my face and, and it was at that point when I, I just said, dude, I got to do something different. I don't know what else to do because I'm qualified for nothing, but I got to do something else. And, you know, I, I had already been working on this trading thing as, as kind of a part-time hobby. And I just made a decision that I was going to make that a, a career and I was going to do it in short order. And I was going to put myself in a position where I wasn't going to miss, I wasn't going to miss my kid's life because I was, I was trapped in this box of things that I knew how to do. So don't, don't let that be you. You know, you 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 have different passions and different desires than I do, and you're doing it for different reasons. But you know, don't let where you are now determine where you are tomorrow. It's just it's absolutely unnecessary, and life is way 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 too short, as the people in uh, in Texas are figuring out. But guys, let me tell you a little bit about Smart Move before we get started. If you guys own real estate, so some of you guys are already well along your way in this path to uh, to financial and and economic and life freedom. And you're looking for a place, you're looking for renters, essentially. But how do you know whether your tenants have good credit or whether they pay their bills on time or whether they trash the place? What, how do you know? Eviction, evicting a tenant can cost as much as $3,500 and take as long as four weeks. I'm actually shocked that they wrote four weeks in here as long as because I, here in Kansas, it can take six months to evict someone. Uh, I know that from knowing guys who invest in real estate here. One in five tenant applications has a relevant criminal hit. Do you want your, you want your recently purchased rental property to turn into a sin den? Huh? A, uh, a place of, uh, of ill repute? Uh, hopefully not. Hopefully you want to run a well-established business with good people. TransUnion research shows that 20% of renter ap- rental applicants have at least one prior eviction and are likely to be evicted again. How do you know any of this? Let me tell you about Smart Move and find out why what you don't know about your rental applicants and how you can save 25% off of your next tenant screening. If you own a rental property or know someone who does, try Smart Move so you don't find out the hard way that a prospective tenant is an eviction risk. Go to tenantscreening.com, enter my code STAPLETON to get 25% off your next screening. Don't be in the dark about your applicant's history. Know your tenants with Smart Move Tenant Check. Go to tenantscreening.com, enter my code STAPLETON to get started. With Smart Move, you'll get great reports, great convenience, and great tenants. And guys, the best part, you pay as you go. It's no monthly fees. As you have a new tenant in, you just you pay to have the, the screening done, and you get great tenants at a really convenient uh, price. So go check them out. Smart Move. 
excuse me, uh, tenantscreening.com, enter my code Stapleton. All right, let's talk a little bit about what's going on down in Texas. I'm sure it's happened already, although I haven't pulled a report yet, but eventually Trump is going to be blamed for any deaths that occur in and around the area. I think so. Um, well, I guarantee it. Uh, because whatever fallout comes from this, the slow response from FEMA, because FEMA is notoriously slow, they're terrible. And there are still people waiting on their Katrina trailers, by the way. I mean, they're, they just, they never, they always do a poor job of, not, not always, they typically do a poor job of responding. So the media will go out as soon as is humanly possible and start blaming this on Trump. You all remember Katrina and the President Bush flying over the city and how everyone immediately, the, the media just jumped on him and pounced on him. Well, he, he didn't go down to the ground. He just saw it from the air. And obviously he didn't go down there because anytime the president moves anywhere, they have to shut down entire, entire highways. You have Secret Service out there on bass boats just like driving Yeah, down yeah, the exactly. And so he didn't want to he didn't want to mess with the with the effort that was going on the rather poor effort by the way by our federal government but he didn't want to he didn't want to hinder that so he stayed in the air. Trump, uh, Obama had his share of natural disasters that went awry. Uh, never heard one thing one bad thing about President Obama in the natural disasters that uh, that went afoul under his watch or the response that went afoul. Uh, you had one in New Jersey uh, that was bad, and and you know, of course, Chris Christie was out hugging Obama, mm-hmm. and there's famous scene of them doing that. Those weren't Obama's fault; those were global warming. Of fault. course, they were. They, so. they, yeah, there were different different reasons, mm-hmm. right? So Trump is now Trump is a quote unquote Republican. None of the media like him. He's going to get. He's good. They're going to try and tarnish him for the response to this. Now, according to this report, I found this. If this is true, this is crazy. Tropical Storm Harvey has dropped more than 11 trillion gallons of water on Texas. 11 trillion gallons in unprecedented flooding in the Houston area. Uh, There may be no parallel available to any other rainstorm in U.S. history based on numbers of people affected, amount of water involved, and other factors meteorologists have warned. They went on to say that they are expecting an additional 16 trillion gallons of of rain that will fall in the state based on forecasts from the National Weather Service. So the amount of rain that's fallen, they're expecting that yet again is going to continue to fall. And I just, I, that was just a statistic that I wanted to throw at you guys because I found it, uh, that that's crazy. That is nuts. And Houston is underwater and, and much of the other areas are underwater. I, ha- I know some people down in Texas, and, and they have no power. They have no cell reception. They have no internet, nothing. And I don't, they're, they're riding the storm out, I think. But it didn't take long. Um, there is an article out from heavy.com that says, Why wasn't Houston evacuated before Hurricane Harvey? Why wasn't Houston evacuated? Essentially, they're saying, Why wasn't there a mandatory evacuation order issued? I'll read to you from the article. It says, why wasn't Houston evacuated? Why wasn't there a mandatory evacuation order from the city? Who's to blame? Because naturally someone Mm -hmm. other than the person in the home is responsible for the fact that the person is in the home. You see, if you didn't decide to leave, that's not your fault. If you're stuck on top of your home after a tropical storm that you had days notice was coming, hits your house, and now you're underwater, that's not your fault. Someone else is to blame because they didn't come and hold your hand and tell you how important it was that you leave your house. City and county officials are facing those questions, uh, facing these types of questions, and why the evacuation order was not given. Houston residents were given mixed messages before the storm struck. The Republican governor suggested evacuation, but the Democratic mayor and the Republican judge overseeing the city's emergency operations suggested otherwise. Now, you see what they're doing here. They're, they didn't say the governor suggested, but the mayor and a judge overseeing the emergency operations suggested otherwise. Say the Republican governor, the Democratic mayor. So we have to, we can't just you know, usher responsibility onto a person without putting them into into a pocket. They have to go in a hole somewhere, right? So this guy's Republican, this guy's Democrat. 
That way you, you know right from the beginning who you're going to be angry at. Mm-hmm. If you read this as a Democrat, of course, you're angry that the Republican governor didn't issue an outright evacuation order. If you read this and you are a Republican, you're angry at the Democratic mayor. So you just get to pick who you want to be angry at. The point is, though, you're angry at somebody, right? We're now over. No one's asking the question that, hey, hey, dummy, why didn't you leave your house? If 50 inches of rain were about to dump on top of you and you're in a low-lying area, hmm? maybe it's your responsibility. Maybe the government isn't your parent. Maybe it's not their job to hold your hand and make sure that you've got clear information about what you need to do. Because here's the thing. Governor Abbott uh, encouraged residents to evacuate low-lying and coastal areas of the state, even if a mandatory evacuation order had not been issued. What you don't know, he said. And what nobody else knows right now is the magnitude of flooding that will be coming. That was what Governor Abbott said. So here's how it worked. I'll explain it to you. Governor Abbott took a look at it and he said, this looks like it's going to be really bad. Y'all should leave. I'm telling you that right now. We have no idea how much this is going to hit, but we already know if an inch of rain falls in Houston, we see flooding. So this is likely to be very serious and you should leave town. However, I am not going to up on high dictate that everybody in the city has to leave or everybody in the state has to leave. What I will do is I will leave it up to the local city managers, the mayor, the city council members to decide whether or not individual cities should be evacuated or not. And the local city municipality said, no, stay where you are. No, ignore that. Don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. No, this is all being overblown. No reason to get on the road. You're better off riding out the storm at home because when Hurricane Rita hit, or Tropical Storm, I can't remember which one it was. When Rita hit, they issued an evacuation and something like 40 million people or something got on the road at the same time and it just caused gridlock. And some people died on the road, and it was a big problem. And so they were afraid if they issued a mass evacuation and they forced people to get in their cars and get on the road, that they would have a similar situation and it wouldn't bode well for them politically. So they said, no, 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 no. It'll be all right. It won't be as bad as everybody says it is. And then they put their head down. Now, this is despite the fact that the National Weather Service was calling for like 50 inches of rain. They were saying, no, you're, you're going to get screwed. It's coming. And they did nothing. But again, this is what I, I want you, this is what I want to get into your head. All right? You are responsible for you. At the end of the day, your actions dictate where you end up. And that's the case with, during a tropical storm as well. Every single person in Houston had days of notice. You could have gotten out of the city if you wanted to. Now, if you wait until six hours before it's supposed to hit, then yeah, you might be log jammed on the highway trying to get out of town with everybody else. But with a little proper planning, with a little preventative maintenance on your part, you could have been out of the city days before anything hit. It is not the government's responsibility to show up at your home, nor do they have the right, by the way, to show up to your home and tell you you have to leave. That's what the article's angry about. They're angry that a, an, an order to evacuate didn't happen. Because then you would have the National Guard, you would have the, the, the police coming door to door and saying, you have to leave. Pack your stuff, get out of town, you can't stay here. It's not the government's role. It's not their job. They don't have a right to do that. It's your property. It's your land. If you want to stay there, it's your body. If you want to stay there and risk it and ride it out, you have the response. You have the right to do that. If you choose not to, you accept the responsibility for that. And the answer that that what I always get from people, I say, well, Jason, what about the poor? What about the, the poor can't leave? They don't have the money. They don't have the resources. They can't get out of town. You just hate poor people. No, here's the thing. Here's what I would say to you. I said, The choices that you make determine where you are, right? This goes the same thing for people who are poor. I I don't want my thoughts and prayers before I say go any further. I want you guys to understand. I should have said this at the top of the discussion about uh, about the, the storms is that 
my my thoughts and prayers go out to everybody who is there, and I don't want anything I say to be misconstrued as being as being heartless or critical of anyone who's suffering in in the city, right? Because it's not just Houston; it's it's all over the coast there, uh, the Gulf Coast. But I do want you to understand that if we look at this emotionally, we will draw whatever conclusion we want. If we look at it to at it analytically and honestly then we oftentimes come up with a very different response, even though that response may be unpalatable. So if we know that our decisions determine where we're at, and you find yourself in a position where you've lived in this country your entire life, and you can't scrape together a couple hundred bucks in gas and food money to get yourself out of town, whose fault is that? Is that the government's fault? Is that your neighbor's fault? I just spent the first half of this show explaining to you guys where I come from. You guys know I barely graduated high school, right? I, I got a D minus in government. That's the only reason I got out of high school. Had it not been for that, I wouldn't have been able to graduate. Like, I'm qualified to do nothing on paper other than the actual accomplishments that I have. Now, you take a look at my accomplishments, I knocked the cover off the ball all day. But I shouldn't be able to do it based on, based on my, uh, my credentials. If you've lived in this country your whole life and you're still making a minimum wage job, you got a problem. Stop being poor. You're that way for a reason. Like I said, there's a difference between being broke and being poor. You understand the difference, right? Broke is temporary. We all been broke from time to time. I may be broke again one day, but I'll never be poor because poor is a mindset. You choose to be poor. You choose to be poor because of your actions. You choose to be poor because of your lack of initiative. You choose to be poor because of your mindset. Broke happens to us all. But poor, poor is something different. So I'm not being critical or, or, uh, or heartless when I tell people who choose to be poor that it's their own fault that they're in the situation they're in. Because it's something you can control. If you happen to find yourself broke at a time in Houston, well, then you have to pay very, very close attention. You have to beg, borrow, and steal. You have to throw on a rucksack, put your family together, and start marching outside the city. Otherwise, you may very well end up dead in downtown Houston. Either that, or you got to go and you got to buy some water and you got to put some stuff on the credit card and you got to hunker down and ride that sucker out. What I'm telling you is where there is a will, where there's initiative, there's a way. But it is in no under no circumstances is it the government's responsibility to make sure that you're taken care of. None. And I hope that that doesn't come off too harsh, but for some reason, we always look for someone to blame. And it's always something external. It's never internal. I'm never responsible. It's always somebody else who did something to me, and woe is me, and if it wasn't for that, I'd be just fine, and nobody loves me, and the world's against me, and my job, my boss hates me, and my job sucks, it's not my fault. No, it is. Absolutely, completely is your fault. See, here's a crazy thing about life, is that you get to take responsibility for both the successes and the failures. The people who are willing to do that have the most success because they recognize when things don't go their way, ultimately it's their problem. It's their problem to solve. People who get the least out of life say, there's nothing I can do. This is just the the roll of the dice. This is fate. My dog's always sick. My dad never amounted to anything. My family's always been in trouble. This is just who I am. If you're saying those things to yourself, you got a problem. And the way you overcome that is to have a mental shift in your mind that says, I'm responsible for everything. Look, even if you're not, because sometimes stuff happens to you, man. Stuff happens. There's a more colorful way to say that, but you understand my meaning. Stuff happens. You are where you are because of how you reacted to that stuff. 
because bad stuff happens to everybody. Everybody hits walls. Everybody has hurdles. Everybody has mountains they have to climb. If you find yourself on the short end of life, it's because of the decisions you made. And I won't, I won't sugarcoat it for you. I won't pat you on the head and tell you it's not your fault. That's what the government does to you. You go see Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton if that's what you want because they love to tell people that. What I'll tell you is, if you are ready to make a change, if you're willing to accept responsibility and you're willing to get off the couch and actually work, then I'll show you how to make more money than you ever thought possible. It's not that hard to do. But without you... Without your total commitment, without your, your willingness to make choices that put you in a position where you can be successful, and without your acceptance of responsibility for the outcome of those decisions, nobody can help you. So, anyway, I just I want you guys to understand that nobody, nobody's going to be there to support you when it's all on the line. And it's not the government's responsibility to do it. It's your responsibility. All right, let me tell you a little bit about Helix Sleep. Guys, I own a Helix bed. It's incredible. And Helix, if you don't understand what they are, they are a truly customizable mattress that costs you five to ten thousand uh, that used to cost you five to ten thousand bucks until now. you know because normally these mattresses are really, really expensive. And you are now in a unique position where you can go to Helix see helixsleep.com, answer a few simple questions, and they'll run a 3D biometrical model of your body through the proprietary algorithm, algorithm that they developed to help you get the best night's sleep you've ever had. It turns out that Helix customers report a 30% improvement in overall sleep quality. I can tell you, we replaced one of the mattresses in our house with, uh, with a Helix mattress, and I didn't even have to say anything. My in-laws came over, they had one night's sleep on it, they came out and said, man, did you guys change your mattress? Man, we, we were rolling into the middle of the last one. This one's incredible. And all it takes is just a few minutes online, you answer a few simple questions, and they will create a customized sleeping solution for you. And if you happen to have a special someone that you lay beside, they can even customize the side of the bed that they sleep on. That way you get independent comfort levels for each of you. You have now a hundred nights to try this bed absolutely free. And if you don't love it, they will pick it up, give you a 100% refund, no questions asked. All you got to do is go to helixsleep.com forward slash Stapleton to get $50 off your order. That's helixsleep.com forward slash Stapleton, helixsleep.com forward slash Stapleton. All right. Hey, before we get off this, Sir. this conversation about the storm, I, I saw out of an article on Zero Hedge. And it got me kind of thinking that we're not going to the, the, the end of this is not over in terms of government involvement. Obviously, FEMA is going to be there for a long time. Hmm. But Zero Hedge in this article made made a statement that I find incredibly shocking. They said damage from Hurricane Harvey is expected to total tens of billions of dollars with current estimates ranging from 20 billion to 40 billion. But here's here's the crazy part. They said, but an unusually large share of victims are lacking adequate protection. They said only one in six have insurance. Now, Houston is the fourth largest city in America, Mm -hmm. and only in that city. But if you look at everybody affected by this storm, if 85% of the people affected by this storm don't have flood insurance, that means they just lost everything. Did you say one in six? That's what the story said. They don't don't say where they get that, that statistic from in the article. But they said only one in six have insurance. How can you not have flood insurance and live in Houston? I don't know. Like, I'm serious. If you get, if they get more than an inch of rain, the ground is so saturated there. If they get more than an inch of rain, it will cause flooding. Yeah, but that's massive. 85% of the people affected, if they don't have insurance, who's going to fund that? There's got, there's got to be calls, or there, there will be calls for the federal government to, to step, step in, in. <laughs> and to provide some type of stimulus package, oh, some type it. of rebuilding. You know it. It's going to happen. It's the same thing that happened in Katrina. Oh, you, you no, because you can't. Rebuilding New Orleans. Darren, you can't be responsible for making sure you have flood insurance. Mm-hmm. Dude, I live on the side of a hill in Kansas. On I, I live on top of a hill, mm-hmm. right? The My yard slopes down to a pond in the backyard, and I have flood insurance. Yes. Like, it's literally impossible for my house to flood, and I have flood insurance. Mm-hmm. 
So I don't know how a guy doesn't have it if he lives in Houston unless he just didn't want to pay for it. But you're right. If he does, if he decides, if one in six, that just seems amazing to me. Yeah. You would think that the insurance companies would require it or the the mortgage holders, the banks would require flood insurance. You live in a low lying area right next to the shore. Because it's kind of like, it's kind of like Katrina, right? Isn't it below sea level or right at sea level or something like that? Close, yeah. That's that's shocking to me that the banks don't, I mean, shoot, you know know what's going to happen is that if the government doesn't step in and just give them some of somebody else's money, uh, you're just going to have people turning the keys over. Mm-hmm. Just being like, hey, it's your problem now, bank. And now well, you can figure out what you're going to do to the it. fourth largest city if a bunch of people are like, eh, I'm not insured. I can't afford to replace this, so I'm just going to walk away. Oh, same thing that happened in Katrina, man. You're going to place get, is going to look like Detroit. Yeah. It's going to become a ghost town. Yeah. Well, what happened in Katrina was all these really, really uh, crime ridden and, and I guess uh, poverty ridden areas, mm-hmm. everybody moved out of, everybody moved out. Mm hmm. And they did build some low-income housing for people to move back into, but for the most part, they they tore down a lot of that stuff and built up nicer houses. And so they used it as kind of a um, – kind of like what they did in downtown Kansas City where they scraped like four or six blocks and they put in a, a new development. Yeah. They do the same thing. Um, and so at least that's that's the what I saw happen several years afterwards. But, you know, because, I mean, Brad Pitt was down there building – crummy houses there for a while for for people who were in need but for the most part they they took a lot of that area and they just turned it into they used it they sold the land off and developers came in and built new stuff Mm -hmm. which reminds me by the way jeff carroll put out an awesome video in the facebook page did you see that i built that yeah yeah did you um uh did you watch the video i haven't watched it yet okay yeah because i told jeff that i sent jeff a note i hope he i hope he private messages me or calls me uh because i said it's in kansas city He's building oh, okay. a development here in Kansas City, and I knew he was, but I didn't realize that it was that like, he already had it all laid out. Mm-hmm. And I said, "Dude, we've got to get a, a film crew, and we need to go do a walkthrough and do a proper like documentary of what you're doing because there's no better. I mean, he's building low income housing for families at two hundred, uh, hundred, two hundred to three hundred dollars. I think he said below market rates for those homes, and he's doing it as a for profit business." He's not running a charity. It's for profit. He's been working on it for 20 years. His own money, all his own risk capital. Do you know where it's at? I don't know where it is. That's the thing is that I I need need him to call me so I can take a look at it and and we can go out together next time he's here in town. Because he comes around, I think, every two or three months, I think he's here just to oversee kind of the the progress. He's been fighting with the government for years over getting tied into the wastewater and things like that. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just been the government's made it almost impossible for him to get the job done because uh, he was telling me the story last time he was in town. And I mean, we got we got to get out there and, and walk through the houses and show him what he's doing and just say, yeah, this is a for profit project. Just mm-hmm. because you're doing stuff for low income people doesn't mean you have to do it for free. And most important thing he was making, the most important point he was making was, look, I built the road. I built the houses. I laid the sewer. I did all of that. And then the government comes in and they charge me for that. I never get reimbursed for it. And they end up taking it over. And he said, I tie in and I got to pay for the electrical to tie into the electrical. I got to pay to tie into the sewer line. When in fact, private industry is the one that built all of that. Mm Mm-hmm. He said, so when you talk about who will build the roads, well, it's guys like me who build the roads now. And he's right. The truth is that most of these guys would prefer to be able to hold on to the road that they built. They would like to be able to have the right to create the road and to charge money for the toll if you're going to get on a, you know, you know, on a multi-lane highway. It's just a simple matter of the fact that the government takes ownership. And it's, I mean, I just want to talk to him about it and want to show everybody what he's doing out there because it's, it's charitable, number one, and it's profitable at the same time. Yeah. It's crazy. It checks all the boxes. Anyway, so I want to tell you guys about an article I read in Reason Magazine. Well, it was, it was on the website, but Reason.com. Now, normally, I'm kind of in line with Reason. I mean, we, we, we're somewhat pretty much copacetic. In, in our views on liberty and freedom and all that stuff. But they have an article in here that I'm just, I'm shocked that they wrote. And it's written by a guy named CJ. Oh, of course, it's not easy. 
C I A R A M E L L A. Darren? Ciara Mella? There we go. Ciara Mella. CJ Ciara Mella. How did you do that? I just said that to you. I figured you were going to go. I <laughs> mean, you didn't. I'm college educated. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Educated. All right. This is what he said. Donald Trump pardoned former Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio on Friday, one of the most abusive, racist, and divisive lawmen. And right there, I'm like, really? Joe Arpaio? How is... Uh, let me read further. So I continued to read. But that's what got me to read the article, was that first opening paragraph. It says, A federal judge found Arpaio in contempt of court on January, in July, for uh, flaunting a 2011 order to stop the unconstitutional racial profiling and, and detainment of Latino residents. Now, of course, they don't say Latino Americans because they're not. Uh, and you notice that he didn't actually get charged with a crime, right? He got charged with contempt for not obeying a court order. So the court said, you know what? We think that this is unconstitutional uh, racial profiling. Really? Well, then why isn't Arpaio in jail? If he was doing that, why wasn't he charged with racial profiling and he goes to jail for that? Why would you put him in jail for contempt? Or why would you, you know, charge him with contempt it's because they don't have him on racial profiling because he's not really doing that but let's keep reading he says our prior was investigated twice by the justice department's civil rights division for constitutional abuses no charges mind you but he was investigated twice so i guess cj if you get investigated by the justice department it's automatically means you're guilty i mean this is shocking to me right mm-hmm. no charges Never convicted of any wrongdoing, but the simple fact, he's using the simple fact that the Justice Department Civil Rights Division investigated him as proof that he's a racist, bigoted lawman. He goes on, Arpaio was elected sheriff of Maricopa County in Arizona in 1993. He made a national name for himself with his unconventional and demeaning incarceration practices. For those of you who don't know how Arpaio works... He decided that there's no reason that jail has to be comfortable. There's no reason that you should get a TV in jail. There's no reason that you should have air conditioning. He's like, I mean, I think about life today and the fact that we have air conditioning. Every time I go outside and it's like a thousand degrees and humid. And I'm like, dude, how did people survive in the summertime without air conditioning? But it turns out for hundreds and hundreds of years, people managed to make it through a summer without air conditioning. In, some, in much more hostile situations than we find ourselves in today, and certainly more than in, uh, in uh, Arizona. So here's what he would do was, he said, you know what, we're going to put everybody in tents outside. No reason to build these huge structures. We'll just build some big fences. We'll put tents up outside, and they can all wear striped uniforms like the old, the old guys used to do. And we'll put them in pink underwear just because we can create underwear in any color. And why make them comfortable? So they can wear pink underwear and striped uniforms. Just breast cancer awareness. Yeah, underwear. I'm sure. Yeah, football players do it all the time. And then we'll put them in tents. And if it gets to 120 degrees in the summertime, then so be it. Tough. And then there's nothing saying that we you know we'll send them ham sandwiches or whatever. There's nothing saying that the food has to be good. Like jail's not a place you want to be. We don't want people in jail. So we're going to make it as uncomfortable as possible for you to be in jail. So maybe... We save the taxpayers a little bit of money. And number two, maybe you don't want to come back. So this is his general idea of how you should run things. Now, if you think it is unconstitutional or an abuse to put somebody in a tent when it's 120 degrees outside and that's unbearable, then why are you, up, why are you not upset that we have Marines doing the same thing in southern Afghanistan right now? Hmm? I mean, Marines live like that all the time. Eating That's their, MREs. Yeah, eating MREs. That's their life. So it, it's certainly, it's a hardship, but there's nothing saying that prison is supposed to be a cakewalk. So his jail, and it's not prison, it's jail. But my point being is that 
you know, jail does not have to be a comfortable place, but he just, he's been, ever since he started doing this, the lawsuits have just piled up. He's like something like 2,200 lawsuits that he's got at any given time. And he's always being investigated by the justice department. They're always trying to hit him on civil rights violations. And guess what? Any convictions? Nope. He, so he said, uh, let me finish reading here. Uh, among Aparo's other achievements, uh, uh, ignoble achievements, was running one of the only female and juvenile chain gangs in the nation. Again, nothing wrong with making people work. They're in prison. We go out, we work, we come back. You don't want to work? Fine. You can sit in solitary confinement. It's your choice. Arpaio further raised his profile by ordering large-scale sweeps of Latino neighborhoods and traffic stops of Latino drivers to round up illegal immigrants. So he is accused of profiling illegally profiling Latinos in order to try and catch illegal immigrants who are in the country illegally. Now, I don't have any specifics about what he was doing there. What I do know is he's never been convicted of a crime. So whatever he was doing was not severe enough or serious enough to actually be convicted of anything. And to say that in this day and age is something. It's saying he's being very careful about what he's doing. But for being such an outspoken proponent of the rule of law, I'm reading from the article again, Arpaio has never been a fan of the law as it applies to himself. The contempt charge was the culmination of decades of battles with Arpaio in the court, starting in 1995, when the court ordered him to improve health care and mental health treatments in his jails. That same year, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division launched an investigation into allegations of excessive force and other constitutional violations at the tent jail. Again, no conviction. Because if there was a, I don't even have to look it up, because if there was a conviction, they would say he was convicted of, because this guy is a tool. But there's no conviction here. He goes on to say, the Justice Department filed civil rights lawsuits against Maricopa County Sheriff's Office in 97, but the suit was dismissed in 98. Therefore, clearly convicted of nothing. In 2008, Arpaio's jail lost its accreditation after investigators found jail officials provided false information about conditions inside the facility. Again, no criminal conduct, no civil rights violations. They managed to get him on a Martha Stewart style lying charge. That's what it is. The man's been facing lawsuits since he decided that he was going to make being in jail uncomfortable. I mean, here's the thing. I think that our entire legal system is screwed up. I really do. I think it's screwed up from the ground up. But I don't think this guy's the problem. I don't think he's a racist, bigot, um, unconstitutional lawman. I think the system is broken. I don't think we should have people in jail for petty drug crimes. I think that if you're in jail, it should only be because you refuse to pay restitution and damages to the person that you harmed. Or, on the opposite end of that, if you are so dangerous that letting you out of jail would cause a serious problem to the community. I don't think we should be sending people to jail and then forcing taxpayers to pay for them to be incarcerated. I think that's ridiculous, stupid. So I think that our entire legal system is messed up. And that's just once you go to jail. Then you talk about the legal process before that. It's wrecked. So I don't disagree that there are all kinds of problems with our legal system. I'm just telling you, this is a guy who's never been convicted of anything other than flaunting a court order. So is is that what the pardon was for? Yeah. Was for the, the, the contempt of contempt court? Contempt of court. Mm. Yeah. So he was held in contempt of court, and the president came out and pardoned him for it. And of course, now this is a symbol for everybody saying, oh, this, is, this just proves what a racist he is and all this other garbage, right? He was convicted. He was held in contempt of court. That's what they got him on. After more than a decade, the guy's been dealing with lawsuits in not, since 95. After more than a decade of battling it in the court, the only thing that they could get him on was contempt. Now, that ought to tell you something about what he's doing down there. Because in this day and age, you look at somebody wrong and you're fired. You say the wrong thing, you out. So it's especially if you're in government. So the fact that this guy continued to get elected and reelected, 
And the fact that the government that was attacking him and trying to get him the whole time Obama was in office and, and their Justice Department couldn't get him on anything, that should tell you something. And I don't know why they feel it necessary here at Reason to go out and attack this guy and make claims that he's a, a racist and divisive and abusive when in fact what he really is is a guy who's making jail uncomfortable for people. And he's going out and he's saying, hey, if you're driving around and you fit the profile of an illegal immigrant, we're going to stop and check. Again, I don't have a problem with that because I don't have a problem with profiling. I think if there's a reason to pull you over and stop you, if you've committed a if you've committed a crime and you look like somebody who could potentially be in the country illegally, can barely speak English, driving a car with outdated tags, you know, not registered to you, maybe we check this guy and see if he's an illegal immigrant. I don't know, it's just me. So I don't have a problem with that either. What I have a problem with is a government that says this is no longer acceptable. Like now you have to play by a different set of rules. Now we're going to decide what what is acceptable conversation. We're going to decide what's acceptable questions to ask. I mean, do you guys have any idea the type of stuff? Like one of the questions that I want to ask uh, that uh, I don't even know if I could say this or not. I oh, shoot, I'll say it. So I was interviewing, I remember I was interviewing that one gal, she came into town and I was, she wanted to come work for the company, right? Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things that I wanted to ask her, but I didn't ask her was, does she have a boyfriend? Uh, but because I was wondering like, if she's in college and she's got a boyfriend and it's a serious relationship, like, is he planning on moving here or are they going to get married and move here or kind of what's the situation there? Now that's already a, an uncomfortable question to ask because it's a, because of the the she's a woman and I'm a man. But right. I really wanted to know that just purely because hey, if there's going to be friction there before I make any decisions, I kind of want to know because I don't I, want there to be a problem. It's later. like when Charles came on, we mm-hmm. flew him and his wife down here yes. to make sure that they thought it was going to be a good fit, correct? And that it was going to be you know they were going to have to relocate and make sure that they were good with that, and so yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I flew not only Charles, and I flew his whole family in. Yes, yeah. Because I said, I want all of you here. I want her to be comfortable. Right. I want her to see the city. I don't want her just showing up, and, and I wanted a chance to talk with her and find out whether she was really on board with moving out here. Because, man, you, you get somebody to uproot their home, and they come all the way out here, mm-hmm. and then she ain't happy. And next thing you know, six months, 12 months later, they're, they're yeah. on their way out again. Well, now there's a lot of investment there in time and, and money that now you got to do all over again. But I don't even know if I can ask that question. Like, technically, there's a whole list of stuff now. As an employer, you're not allowed to ask applicants. Can't ask them how much money they made at their last job. You can't ask them anything personal. Can't ask them if they're planning on having a kid in the near future. Like, none of that. Didn't we see an article not too long ago that they wanted to make it illegal for you to ask if they had a criminal background? Yeah, yeah. They, it was illegal to create the form that says yes, because that, di- that would discriminate against people who had felony convictions. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, it's amazing to me, the stuff now that you have to be careful of because of the PC culture we live in. The truth is, I ought to be able to ask any question I want, Mm -hmm. and I shouldn't have to worry about somebody suing me over it. And I I, I can't because of, you know, lawyers. And so this is just, to me, this this is lawyers deciding to try and make a living off of suing somebody because of what he, they don't like what he's doing. And now you got reason.com out you know, just eviscerating the guy when in fact he's never been charged with a crime or he's never been convicted of a crime. Excuse me. You always did say if you were going to serve, you were going to serve as a sheriff because they had the most power. Dude, being a sheriff would be the, I can't even say, it would be awesome. Yeah. Because you have, the only people you answer to are your are the people that elected you. It's like you can, everybody else can go screw themselves. You can tell the federal government to go screw themselves. You're like, no, this is, now this is people where. show up, we're going to arrest you. Yeah. Hey, FBI, you know, if any of you all show up here, we're going to throw you in jail because this is my house. I would totally be a sheriff, man. My town. Here, yeah, I didn't tell you. I don't know if I told you this, but the sheriff in Johnson County was retiring. And I actually called the mayor and because uh, he's a friend of mine. And I said, uh, hey, uh, you guys know who's running for mayor out there, running for sheriff out there? <laughs> like, it's a little late. I don't think I have time, but... <laughs> 
might try and squeeze my name in there. <laughs> like I was seriously thinking about it. I always said I would never run for political office, but if I was going to do it, man, sheriff would be the spot. Yeah. And Johnson County Sheriff is a pretty good gig. Yeah. yeah I'll that, bet it pays well. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It may, may make, some, make some good money. Is that something you could do part-time? Uh, no, no. Uh-huh. And it, I just, I wanted to see. Yeah. I just wanted to, to, to throw it out there. Because you never know when you make that kind of inquiry. Mm-hmm. Like if they're really looking for somebody, and he and I know each other, so yeah. he knows who I am. He knows Is my background. the mayor background. that I think you're talking about? Yeah. Uh-huh. Copeland. Yeah, yeah. yeah Mike. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mike, Mike Copeland. And uh, he, he he knows me, and, and uh, we're, we're, I mean, we're a good, not good friends, but we're acquaintances. Sure. And uh, you never know when you drop that out there, what's going to come back. Yeah. Like he may say, no, you, you interested? Would, you would be good for that. You would, you'd be excellent. You know, let me talk to let's some talk some people. Yeah, let, me, let me make some phone calls. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do it unless you really is. So you never know yeah. how that's going to play itself out. So you, you know, you always want to kind of leave those doors open. Yeah. But anyway, guys, hey, thanks so much for being here. I will be back here tomorrow to do it all over again. Until then, be safe. Be good. Talk to you then.